Welcome back, everybody. We're going to continue in our series uh, for very important uh, voting issues, social issues that are coming up in Catholics' minds as they prepare for this important election on November 3rd. And, you know, one of the major issues that always comes up in any election is different economic views. And there's so many different policy um, opinions and uh, positions by different political candidates. I think it's important for us to uh, have a real sense of what the Catholic Church's doctrines are on economic policy. So um, uh, Father Kirby is here guiding us. Father, great to see you again. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Connor. Good to be on the show. All right. So um, the economy, you know, a lot of people say, and a lot of my conservative friends kind of think that the church needs to stay the heck out of economics, politics, but especially economics. You know, what the, what in the world could the church have to offer about the stock market or about running a business? Um, and, but they don't quite know. Hey, look, I've just noticed over your left shoulder is the compendium of the, uh, was, was it the, the compendium on the Catholic church social doctrine? Is that right? That's right. Exactly. Yep. 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 And so I just happened to notice that, but that is the book that actually proves my very point that the church has taught that the social, political, and economic issues are have moral principles underlining all of them, and, and a good Catholic must be aware um, of what those principles are. And especially when it comes to the economy, people think they need to stay out of it. But, you know, uh, our the Holy Fathers throughout history, um, especially Leo the Thirteenth back in 1891, um, with the the great encyclical, one of the greatest encyclicals of all time, in my opinion, Rerum Novarum. You know, he he saw economic theory as barreling down on the world. On the one hand, he saw communism arising. He saw the dangers of communism, or to a lesser extent, socialism. Um, and he saw the, the restriction and taking away of private property. He saw Marxism on the rise that was atheistic at its very, at the heart of it. But on the other hand, he saw the booming of the English um, Industrial Revolution. And there was no child labor laws. There was no minimum wage. There was no uh, even a sense of a living wage required. There was there was no regulations, health regulations, safety regulations. People were being mauled by uh, the mills. People were working um, in unhealthy and unsafe uh, conditions. So he saw this, uh, and he saw it as the extreme on the other side of the political or economic spectrum from communism. And so um, he guided the church, Leo the Thirteenth guided the church through these two extremes yes. and this great encyclical rerum novarum. So I kind of preface our conversation with that because as I understand it, a lot of the stuff in that compendium of the social doctrine behind your shoulder and the rest of our conversation, a lot of it's guided by rerum novarum that Leo the 13th put into place. Um, Centissimus Annus, written by uh, John Paul II, uh, St. John Paul II, uh, is the 100th anniversary, Centissimus, the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. So there has just been so much great work in the church done on these issues that I hate it, especially when I expect liberals to ignore the church. Mm -hmm. But when I hear conservatives do that um, and think that the church needs to stay out of these kinds of matters, it's, it's distressing to me because I, I see they don't understand this falls under the moral theological teachings of the Catholic Church. Not that the church is here to tell us exactly what our tax code should say, right. but they provide us principles. So I've rambled long enough about that. Sorry, Father, but that's kind of setting the stage for this. So in terms of the economy, um, one of the things that you've done in your work is is you have you have sort of given a certain virtue that is, you know, um, a guiding principle as we think about a particular subject. So in terms of economic policy or economics, theory of economics, and as a voter who's getting ready to go into the voting booth, you know, what is the virtue that they should be uh, seeking in their thinking and living out uh, in terms of economic policy? Yeah, so, so Connie, you've given a, a lot there. If I uh, maybe um, address just a few things. Uh, first, 
the compendium of Catholic social doctrine uh, that uh, you recognize on my shelf. Uh, I want to point out to our listeners that um, Father Enrique Colomb, who was one of the major writers of that, was actually one of my professors. Awesome. Uh, I studied under him. And in fact, I remember having a tutorial with him on the writings of Father uh, Pinkers, one of the great moral theologians. So I studied with Father Colomb, who helped write the social doctrine as we studied Father Pinkers. So I just. And, and Pinkers, we both, I learned about Pinkers at, at Steubenville in an ethics class. And he wrote a beautiful book on the Beatitudes, and you, and I think you had that too. And, and yeah, that, that, that led us to doing the Beatitudes program that we did, Kingdom of Happiness, through TAN. So it's interesting that there's all these little, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, intellectual connections. But sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's good. I think it's the uh, um, the version of the community of saints on earth. There's this you know this spiritual yeah. connection of 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 work of 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 the kingdom. So I mentioned too, just some of that, so that when people are hearing answers as we talk and so on, that, that these are not my opinions or your opinions, like, you know, we're, we're attempting to present the teachings of the church in order to form our consciences. So with that in mind, as you were saying, Connor, like, you know, we need moral principles and virtues, because if we don't give ourselves moral principles and virtues, and we approach questions of our society, we will think and act as unbelievers, because we're fallen. So if we don't build up our consciences, if we don't allow our soul to be empowered by grace, by God's grace, then we will think as the unbeliever. So I went oftentimes when people say, well, I want to talk about this, I want to talk about that. Okay, well, first, let's back up and review our principles and our virtues so that we make sure that we're speaking as believers. Because otherwise, again, we'll be going by criteria that is of the fallen world. And that's not how we move, and that's not how we live as Christians. So with that if I can just address the whole economy and then address the specific virtue. When the church approaches the economy, it's much like she approaches the governments of the world. The church will work with any government. She favors none. She approaches and she gives moral principles in order to assist government to fulfill its function given by God and to build up the common good. Exact same way the church approaches the economy and she gives moral principles. So to so those who say the church should stay out, right. uh, they're misguided. But also those who think that, you know, the church or churchmen who think that they should get into the nitty gritty, oftentimes far beyond their competency. Right. That's just as wrong. So either are extremes. Again, we need these, these moral principles, these virtues. And the virtue that shines out when we discuss the economy is the powerful virtue of justice. Now, let me just say, <laughs> that justice is a very important virtue. Oftentimes people will dismiss it because they think of justice only in terms of its punitive expression. So when, when justice is being used in order to bring forth discipline or, or some type of punishment, but justice as a virtue is much broader. Justice is giving to another person their due. It means that justice is also expressed in a positive manner. So if my neighbor lets me use their backyard to do some gardening, then I should make sure that I take care of my neighbor's backyard. And then when I'm done gardening, that I clean the area and make sure that it's as good or better than when they first loaned it to me. Mm -hmm. So there's a positive expression of justice to give this person their due. So when we approach the economy, there is a sense of justice. Like what is due to each party? What is due to the common good? What is due in terms of moral principles? And we apply this principle of justice, this virtue of justice, in order to help us to have a moral economy. Not that an economy takes on a specific identity, but the principles of the agents of those involved in the economy are formed and are exercised by moral principles. You know, we were talking once before about um, Plato's Republic. So I'm, I'm an amateurish philosopher, um, but definitely a philosopher at heart. And I love the, the writings of Plato. His notion of justice, I think, applies somehow here. His notion of justice was was a culmination of all the other virtues. It was order and structure bringing everything together. So it was a very holistic concept of justice. It, yeah, it wasn't just the opposite of mercy or something. It wasn't. Um, it was. It was about a just soul or a just state function in a holistic, yeah. fulfilling way. And you know, and I think that the virtue of justice, uh, if we had a just economy or a just politic it would be giving everybody involved their due. 
um, it would be giving employers their due and it would be giving employees their due. It would be giving families dependence upon the employee their due. It would be giving the state their due through a proper amount, a just amount of taxation or support. It would be giving everyone their due and that brings about order and harmony and structure. And I think that sort of relates to Plato's understanding of justice as being the summation of all these other virtues in society because it created a just society, which which entails all these other positive attributes. So I can see how, you know, an, an economy or a, a state, a country that has a ruined economy, it, it's not going to function right. right. So justice is kind of that governing virtue. And it, it has to mean a lot more than just putting the bad guy in prison. Right. When you have a just economy, it takes care of, it, it creates so much more order and structure throughout the entire body politic. Okay. Um, so I, th I think Plato had a point there and I can kind of see, uh, you know, a relation to that. Um, now, a next, the next question uh, I'd like you to try to address a little bit is, is, the, is the notion of private ownership. Now, um, the early Christians um, lived in a certain kind of uh, almost monastic-like community in the sense where they had maybe monastic is not the right word, but they shared common property. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a Christian ideal they were striving for. Uh, I guess it didn't work because it didn't last that long. But then, you know, fast forward 400 years and you have monks or hermits living in the desert and they realize, no, we have to come together. Um, and so they form monastic communities. You have the rule of St. Benedict. And, you know, there are certain um, aspects of a, of a communistic kind of way of living, at least in terms of money, because there's mm. common ownership, yes. um, which in my mind actually is different from not owning anything. You know, you're actually commonly owning it. So you have use for it. So, you know, I can see that many, you know, altruistic people have a, have a tendency to think that a true Christian society would be one where private ownership is not needed because, mm -hmm. Hey, that's what holy monks do. So, um, but at the same time, um, I see what, you know, God gave Adam and Eve certain things in the garden and there's only 10 commandments. And he says, thou shalt not steal. That's one of them. Well, you can't steal if no one owns anything. So it ain't theft if no one owns it. So, um, clearly at the very, very earliest stages of, you know, salvation history, God is protecting private ownership to some extent. So let's talk about um, what the church has to say about private ownership. So the Christian tradition and the Roman Catholic Church, since our founding by the Lord Jesus, has been the absolute most staunch supporter of private property. In fact, there are three essential things that communism betrays that the Christian church, the Christian tradition has always upheld religious liberty, private property, and self-determination. Mm -hmm. All of those are violated by communism. But some people say, well, that's communism, but socialism is different. So then they will argue a certain socialism. Now, here's the difficult. Let's go to Acts of the Apostles, as you referenced the early church. Someone could read that and say, well, see, there, there's an example of communism. Right. And, and the problem there, I'm going to draw some things from Acts of the Apostles here, but before that, Here's the struggle for a lot of people. And I wanna to try to make this as clear as possible, but I don't wanna to be too simplistic. Many of the goals of socialism are shared by the Christian faith, that we yes. would share our property, that we would serve the poor, that there would be no one without work, that, and so on. Everyone would receive their due and so on. The difference between the Christian faith and socialism is that socialism believes that we do not know how to use our property or care for ourselves or care for society, that someone else, principally the government or the party, has to take care of it. Wow. So it completely diminishes self-determination. So if you go to the Acts of the Apostles, they shared everything in common. However, look at the whole, the whole context. There's a story told about Ananias and Sapphira. They're a married couple. They sell land. So obviously they're selling land, so they're still retaining private property. Right. They're selling land, but they lied to the apostles 
about how much the land was sold for, and they try to give a false tithe. And they tell this lie, first the husband and then the wife, and both drop dead in front of the apostles. And they drop dead, not because they were greedy, but because they lied. So mm -hmm. the fact that we see this shared communal that all the Christians gave, they gave, they decided what to give. So this was a self-determination. It wasn't as if the apostles were saying, okay, we're going to divvy up everything. You give this, you give that, you give this. Uh, the idea was, no, one should be generous. There are moral principles. Like This is where the, um, the ideals of socialism are shared with the Christian faith. So are you saying that it didn't matter so much how much they gave as long as they gave it honestly, almost like the widow's might, right? I mean, yeah. she gave what she could, and Jesus praised that. So are you saying that if they had chosen to give less, it would have been accepted so long as it was in good faith, but they they lied about it, and so the punishment was death, but it was because of the dishonesty, not because of the portion given. Is that is that what you're saying? Absolutely, and, and, and in the sacred narrative itself, uh, the apostles say as much. They say, you have not lied to men, but to God. So they are, are chastising this couple for their lies. That's awesome. I've never, I've never heard that distinction, and it makes perfect sense. That's awesome. Yeah. And we can see like throughout our tradition that we have always argued for private property as we have then followed it up with moral norms and virtues that God has blessed you. Now you must be a blessing to others that God has given this to you. You must share this with others, but we can't compel. I mean, our entire faith expressed by the apostles and especially uh, accentuated by St. Uh, Paul, that our entire faith is grounded in freedom. I mean, that's ultimately what, the you know, if we were to look at the predominant monotheistic views of the world, let's say like it's Christian and Islam, Islam, its focus is um, submission, you know, like forced obedience to God. The direct opposite is the Christian faith, who, which its entire way of life is marked by freedom. St. Paul even saying, for freedom, Christ set us free. That in the Christian faith, we can't have anyone you know, demand something or threaten someone to be generous, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and socialism, however, is very comfortable with telling someone, you don't know how to do this, so we're gonna do it for you, and you better give us what we tell you, or there'll be dire consequences. Yeah. So we can see the difference in terms of the means, the methods, the approach, the spirit, in order to get to those ideals. So as Christians, we would say, yes, if, if God has blessed someone, that you know, they should be generous, that they should care for the poor. This, by the way, is why it's so important that we guard our language. I do not agree with the term social justice. Uh, we have a language in the Catholic Church called the works of mercy. Mercy is the fulfillment of justice. When we give to another, it is an act of freedom. It's an act of mercy, the fulfillment of justice. I don't give because someone has demanded or commands or threatens me to give. That's very unchristian and foreign to our social doctrine. Well, that's a, that's a great distinction. Yeah, that's no, that's really, really good. All right, so what about the Catholic social doctrine concept of universal destination of goods? Uh, how do you recon explain what that is and how do you reconcile that with the concept of private property? So it goes back to, I mean, the ultimate argument of the one and the many. So, you know, if someone would say, well, we should, you know, distribute um, the goods of the earth in such a way that, uh, everyone has them in equal, some, to some degree, equal uh, a standing or, or equal distribution, uh, equal ownership. And, and that is completely opposite. Like, so first of all, we know that God blesses certain people to be entrepreneurs. They might need more of the property or the resources of the earth in order to accomplish that. We know that God calls certain people to leadership. So a CEO who, might, who makes a large amount of money uh, because he or she is running a major corporation, as Christians, we're comfortable that they are properly compensated. We immediately say that with follow-up with, but as God has blessed them, you know, they should try to live a simplicity of life so that others can simply live, right? They should be generous, like, you know, that they should not indulge in greed. So we both argue for the structure of society and say, you know, yeah, one should be generous, but this kind of distribution where everyone receives the same uh, that, that's not a better teaching of, of, of ours. Like, no, in fact, we know that there is, there's not a distribution of goods. And in large part, because there are different vocations, responsibilities, callings uh, within uh, society and even within the members of the church. 
But we immediately, again, follow that up with, and I want to make sure our listeners hear this, that we're not saying greed is good. No, we're saying that, you know, that someone has more uh, and someone should then, you know, be a blessing. So we go back again to our moral principles and we remind the moral conscience of those who have been blessed that to whom much is given, much is expected. That as God has blessed them, they should seek to be a blessing to others. All right. So it seems to me that the concept of private property, capitalism, you know, and, you know, I never, well, I never really thought that the question of the free market um, would really be at the ballot box. But I mean, a major contender, um, Bernie Sanders, was a self professed democratic socialist. And some of the policies of the Democratic Party are just flat out socialist, at least how they would be defined um, throughout most of modern history. So, you know, we're, we're, we're becoming, we're, we're, we're flirting with socialism in this country uh, in a way that our parents or grandparents generation would never have guessed, you know, because they saw, especially our grandparents, they saw what happens in a communistic world. And our parents, our parents too, I mean, they remember so vividly the Soviet Union. You know, we were young, we remember it, you know, but they they lived the majority of their young adult life with this with this issue of communism. Mm. But the youngest, you know, the young adults now, um, and I was gonna look up the exact stats before the show, but the it's a staggering amount. It's the majority of young adults, college students who say in surveys that they wish they lived in a socialistic society. And I don't understand how that could possibly be unless they just don't understand what they're even saying. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of one thing. Uh, well, let's talk about that. I mean, how would you respond to a 22 year old person graduating from a secular university who answered on a survey, I wish I lived in a socialistic society. So I, I, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to answer that question um, because as you said, this is um, very predominant in our culture, our society, and in our political discourse right now. I, I would say this, and, and sometimes we can forget this, and, and it's worth just kind of like lifting the veil and reminding people that one of the most predominant socialistic institutions right now in our country is public education. Mm. So the fact that we as Americans are very comfortable with the government educating children, and we know that of itself, that's in, pr in principle, we would still debate that, but there could be a solid grounding, you know, if the education was truly education. But we know that education now is predominantly social engineering. So they are, are twisting and turning the minds of young people, whether it's towards uh, the LGBTQ, whether it's the redefinition of family, whether it's the diminishing of parental rights, and the list goes on. So, so the fact that you would have a young person who would go through 13 years in yeah. the most formative time of their life in a socialistic institution, and then go on to a, a public university whose faculties are predominantly socialistic, and then come out at 22 with massive debt, yeah. no job, and have been really the beneficiary of socialism, of course they would be socialist. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like the plan worked, you know? Right. Um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? right. And, so, and in many respects, uh, they don't know the opposite. Here, here's what I find so damaging to bad education. Bad education creates insecure adults. Because when you are properly educated, you're competent. The, the idea of a liberal education was that we were freed from ignorance. Yeah. You can take someone who's liberally educated, give them almost anything and say, figure it out. And they have the confidence and the creativity to tackle it. Give to most 22 year olds a task that they're not familiar with and say, figure it out and they crumble. Yeah. Even though they have more technology now, it's like, look it up on YouTube. The video will literally show you how to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and yet this is what we have when we uh, surrender our education to socialism, when the universities become socialistic and young people don't understand the real freedom and the power of self-determination, that they can stand on their own two feet by the, both the grace of God and the talents given to them, and they can do something. They can make money, they can create talent, they can provide services. That is a power given to us. John Paul II said that we are co-creators with God. 
And for young people, especially who are the most idealistic, the most creative, who have mm -hmm. energy, that is a great loss for any society and a tremendous loss for our country. Yeah, and they, the, the new generation expects the government to take care of these things. And, you know, for the last night, I'm sitting around the dinner table. It was my twin two-year-olds. It was their birthday, so now they're three. So we had a little three-year-old twins birthday party. But we're sitting around, and my two college kids who are Bellman Abbey, they're both in Trivium, which is has logic in it. You know, they're in a great books program, so they call it Trivium when it was logic. But anyway, they're they're sitting here explaining to me and I thought I was the philosopher, you know, but they're explaining to me the different types of syllogisms, the different, um, you know, all of this stuff I could barely understand, but they're walking me through this. And all I could tell is they, in their explorations of logic and syllogisms and whatnot, I could tell that what I was trying to explain to them is, okay, you might not remember all the details of this when you're 45 or 50, but bad arguments are not going to get by you. Yep. bad rationale, um, bad uh, explanations, whether you're at work or whether it's somewhere else, it's not going to get by you. Your, your mind is being trained in a liberal, true liberal arts way to draw these distinctions and to see truth and falsity uh, for what it is. And so, um, you know, but the modern education doesn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. And so, We've, we've lost the ability to critically think, like you were saying, young people, they're not able to figure things out. In fact, there was a little um, email exchange going on around between a bunch of dads um, the other day, and it was, hey, what's the three most important things for a father to say to your kids, you know? And there was a number of different things, and I, I wanted to add to it the phrase, go figure it out yourself, <laughs> because, you know, and I, with 14 kids, father, I have to say that all the time. And so, but it's making them a little bit more self-determining, you know? Um, and that's something that the youngest generation's missing out. All right, let's, let's get, um, let's talk about capitalism a little bit more because it has a bad rap. In the church encyclicals throughout history, including Rerum Navarum, um, the term capitalism is, is used uh, repeatedly in Catholic social doctrine as, as a problematic economic theory. You have socialism or communism on one side, and then you have capitalism on the other. Now, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that at the time that we're talking early, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, the term capitalism really did refer to a completely unregulated Yep. economic system. Yep. Well, that's not what we have right now. In fact, you know, we have more regulations and red tape in, in the free marketplace than, you know, ever before. Yep. And it's a very hot political debate of how many of those should be taken down. But the word that we now use for a completely unregulated uh, economic system is uh, libertarianism. So that's the word we use. So this is a semantics kind of thing that's changed over time. Um, and I, I wish we didn't always use the term capitalism today mm -hmm. um, because historically that word meant something else, you know. Um, in fact, it, uh, Karl Marx was one of the first to use it um, in talking about they who control the capital, bankers, private investors, they're in control as opposed to the labor workers, them having a certain dignity. So the word even has a, a bizarre, um, you know, uh, genesis in Karl Marx of all people. Um, so, you know, it, it, in my opinion, it's not correct nowadays to say the church is against capitalism um, because semantically the term has changed. Exactly. Is it, it's more correct to say the church is against an unregulated marketplace yes. because they believe that the that the state uh, has a certain duty to the common good. And if it's totally unregulated, then the, the worker, the laborer can get trampled um, by the greed of others. Um, I think that 
in the current day, and it might be different in 20 years because words change, that libertarianism is probably the closest word to that. Um, I'm not asking you to have an opinion on the word libertarianism, but am I getting the concept right? And is it okay for a Catholic nowadays in 2020 to say I'm a capitalist? Yeah, so so th there's a lot there. I would say, first of all, uh, as you described, you know, we, we get this, you know, the word or, or the emphasis on the word from, from Karl Marx. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side, uh, Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, kind of the initial uh, summary or textbook of, of a different capitalism, uh, we say the, the, the good capitalism, uh, you know, he's writing as a, as a, a professor of ethics. Uh, Wealth of Nations is actually a quote from Isaiah, the prophet from the Old Testament. Huh. And he's writing The Wealth of Nations to try to describe both how can we have this self-determination, but also serve the common good. So even in, in its beginnings, you know, this type of healthy capitalism understands the responsibility to the common good. Now, this continues to develop. And, and just so our listeners know that this isn't, you know, Father Kirby and Connor coming up with this. This is actually described in. I think we should come up with some stuff, though, Father. <laughs> and I think, right, right, let's right. do it. Exactly. Why not? Sure. <laughs> but this this summary that, that you've given, Connor, is actually provided by Pope St. John Paul II in Chintesi Mozanos, where he yeah. describes, we could say, a bad capitalism and the good capitalism. So right. almost this Augustinian, the city of man and the city of God. Right. And John Paul II goes to great lengths to show that there is a good capitalism that can exist within the free market. And the free market is distinct from capitalism, you know, but capitalism is a very effective means for the free market to operate. In fact, we know statistically that the greatest cure <laughs> to world hunger is actually good capitalism. Right. It has done more to eradicate hunger in the world than any other system economic theory uh, before. So there's a good capitalism. We have to, of course, clarify that and understand that, but th it has its place. Here, here's what I sometimes get frustrated with is, you know, the church has these clear teachings. I, I, as a moral theologian and, and, and as a priest, I wanna make sure that, that I'm always faithful to what the church teaches. I don't overstep into other areas that I don't have competency. And when I hear certain churchmen say, well, you know, um, you know, uh, a man dies on the street from hunger and no one cares, but the market drops, you know, one point and it's in all the newspapers, right? Mm. Um, well, you know, first of all, he's way overstepping his bounds. He, he's misapplying a principle and he's just showing his own lack of knowledge because, you know, that one drop in the market could cost thousands to die of yeah. hunger, right? I mean, that affects, you know, the debt of the third world, that affects the opportunity uh, provided by the market. It, it influences the availability of goods, you know? And so again, it's just, I wish sometimes that my fellow theologians would, would stay within their realms, argue the moral principles, and then allow those who are in the economy, who are trained in that area, to then be apply it, you know? And we have good Christians, who are involved in the economy or entrepreneurs who are involved in capitalism that I think could be tremendous resources. Uh, so again, to your point, there is a good capitalism. The free market is a great gift. And I think it's the greatest expression for self-determination uh, in the world of economy uh, today or, or that we've ever had. I speak to Legatus groups a lot. Um, that's a, for those of you who don't know, Legatus founded by Tom Monahan. It's for Catholic executives um and i'm a speaker at a lot of their events to those groups of ceos but one of the things i stress is that you know these these guys are there girls and guys are there because they've been largely successful in in the free marketplace to some extent that's how they became um executives but i always emphasize that you know there is something father in the culture of american watered down lukewarm capital uh, uh, catholicism that has made the, the notion of profit almost a bad word. And, and one thing I emphasize is that profit is a very, very good word. You know why? There is no charity without profit. Because mm -hmm. if I'm just passing charity dollars around, it's not really charity. I mean, but, but when there is a surplus, which means more revenue than expenses, <laughs> mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there is more, I got, I got more than I had to spend and that's profit. Um, then I can actually be charitable. But before then, there, there, you know, there is no charity. So um, profit, you know, is a is a good word. Now, what do you do with that profit? Let's kind of move towards 
the responsibilities of a business enterprise. Um, rare, going back to Rerum Navarum, he talks a lot about a living wage. He talks a lot about the obligations of a corporation. Let's forget the state for a second, but a corporation, how they take care you know, of their employees. And it's complicated. I mean, I, I run a business and there's all kinds of, you know, a living wage in today's world with healthcare costs the way they are, you know, auto costs, um, everyone has internet and cell phones. I mean, it's a it's kind of a different ball game than what a living wage was in 1891. Um, it's a it's a different world. Um, and so, and it's not just a matter of inflation. You know, there's just we have these costs that were not even imaginable back then that really aren't necessary to stay alive, like internet. But yes. you have to have the internet now. You know, you, everyone has to have a cell phone. I mean, it's so the world is structured differently. So it's really hard to figure out what a living wage is in a certain town in a certain time period. Um, is it a second household income? Is it okay for me to pay somebody as it is a second household income? Or do I have to pay every single person in the business as if they could take care of a spouse and three children? You know, um, most businesses cannot afford to do that because our economy is structured in a, in a different way. So, you know, what would you have to say, though, just as guidance for uh, employers, uh, business owners in terms of responsibilities that they have, according to Catholic social doctrine, to uh, their their workforce? Um, or to the economy, you know, at large. Yes, I, I would say probably the biggest uh, thing that I, I would mention that Catholic social, social doctrine is particularly cautious of is uh, government intervention. Then we speak about living wages or, you know, uh, you know, the, the common wage or, or so on. Like, um, you know, the, the church does not favor um, government being involved in this. Oftentimes the government comes from a different perspective. It, it doesn't know the pulse. Oftentimes it, it tries to abolish subsidiarity by creating, you know, a national, um, you know, uh, common wage and so on. And, and, you know, minimum, minimum wage, minimum wage, you know, so uh, this type of thing is just, you know, I, I think that the, the Catholic social doctrine definitely says, you know, let the economy. And again, you know, we are making sure that there are more principles applied there, but let the economy figure this out because, you know, if, if a company is not paying people enough to live, people eventually not want to work there. Work there, yeah. Yeah, and about minimum wage, Father, you know, one of the things that, that that's always on, that's always at the ballot box, right? I mean, the two political parties have such different views, but, you know, for those people that say minimum wage needs to be $15 now, okay, well, why not just make it 20? Why not make it 50? Why not make it 100? You know, I mean, and they'll say, like, you know, if they say I want it to be 15, and I say, well, why not just make it 115? Then it kind of strikes them like, oh yeah, well maybe you can't do that. Well, why not? Yeah. Why not? Because there's a ripple effect to this. Right? It's yeah. gonna, you yeah. know, your your the gallon of milk is gonna cost 27 dollars next week if you do that. You know, which by the way, has been my underlying concern about too much stimulus money, COVID stimulus money going into the economy, is that eventually, if everybody has more money, hyperinflation can occur. Um, but nonetheless. Uh, you know, when the government gets involved in this, it actually tends to work out pretty poorly most most of the time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, so I just I just like that point of, you know, there's certain moral obligations on me at, uh, as a as a somebody who runs a company who has employees. But that's quite a different thing than saying that uh, the Senate or the Congress get to tell me exactly what all of those things are. That's right. Yep. No, that's really good stuff. All right. Well, in, in closing, you know, what do you say to the voter who, um, you know, who has a, a charitable heart? You know, they they think the poor should be taken care of. Um, they they look at they and they see big business, which has a lot of evils in it, which is true. I got, you know, for another time. But, you know, the two headed monster of big government and big business, that's another whole conversation. But a lot of people might have a good intent. Um, but their voting uh, habits can actually be very contrary to Catholic social doctrine, particularly as it involves economic issues, um, subsidiarity, uh, the right to some kind of free marketplace restricted in certain ways, but a free marketplace, private ownership, 
um, you know, a lot of these people that vote against those things because they vote for certain political figures, they think they're being charitable. They think they're being kind to the poor. And um, so, you know, just in closing, what's some advice you would give to people struggling over, um, you know, these issues before they go into the ballot box? I want to just say clearly, with, without any uh, confusion and with no equivocation, that Catholic social doctrine is absolutely, totally, unconditionally opposed to any form of socialism. So we are not socialists as Christians. We believe in religious freedom, private property, and self-determination. So whatever policies or worldview or laws flow from socialism, uh, we can be pretty sure that we are going to oppose them because they violate some intrinsic dignity of the human person. Man, that's awesome stuff. Thanks, Father. It's a lot for everybody to, you know, think about and pray about. Um, I remind my, you know, friends that, that these are moral issues, not just political and economic issues. And I think that's great to, you know, for us to, to have you to guide us through it. So um, we'll have some more shows on these subjects. And uh, thanks a lot. Father Kirby for being here and guiding our listeners uh, in these you know difficult times, and um, uh, I ask our our viewers to say a prayer for Father Kirby and his ministry. He's always very generous to us and sharing his wisdom. So uh, for now, goodbye, and we'll see you next time. Take care.